We'll take your Bible and go to 1 Kings. Now, with all the folks getting sick, make sure that you're taking your vitamins. Well, they say vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, magnesium, potassium, sodium. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm messing. Donuts. <laughs> Donuts. Yeah. There you go. Chocolate. Don't forget that. Very important. Very important. No, doctor. Uh, yeah, there's some. There's some. There's some. Plenty of sweets in the back there. You guys can have that after the church service. That's right. <laughs> uh, a diet of chips and chocolate. You know, Doc Groves up at Pastor Andrus's church. Uh, he's a medical doctor. He says that that uh, vitamin D is very, very uh, important. Take a lot of vitamin D. And uh, so I don't know if I abuse it or not, but it seems to uh, work. Um, I'll, take, I'll take, I'm afraid to tell you the number, but I'll take about 100,000 units in a day, uh, especially if I'm feeling sick. And then just kind of take it, space it throughout the day and, and get a bunch in you and it, it's, it's healthy, or helps me at least. Or it gives me brain damage, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, amen. But uh, I know there's so many opinions on health stuff. You just got to you got to take care of yourself, especially in the what, the way we're going. I mean, if we go the way of Canada, you know, with uh, with you saw what we had Brother Hines where he wrote and he said just trying to get a doctor's appointment to get in. You you got to learn to take care of yourself. You really got to learn to do that. And if you can avoid taking medications, avoid taking as much as you possibly can. Try to get off of that stuff. And I've watched it. Uh, it's you know. This is, this is not nothing to do with this, but uh, I've watched how some of this medication stuff, especially like this uh, stuff that deals with anxiety, I've watched that stuff take people down because uh, it just does someone to mind. Um, I've seen it where you take one, next thing you know, you got to take two, and then you got to take four, and then you got to take more, and uh, eventually some of the guys take up like to 20 something a day of the pills that they take, and, uh, and they're sitting there and they're just kind of, you know, you talk to them and they're spacey, and, you know, come on, do something, do something with yourself, help, help yourself get better, you know. And I think what the psychiatrists have done, now listen, this is really important, I think what the psychiatrists have done is when the patient comes to them and tells them about a bad feeling that they have, Instead of teaching them how to constructively work through those bad feelings, they say, here's a pill, take this so you feel better. So then anytime bad feelings come, you just swallow pills so you don't feel bad anymore. But God gave us those bad feelings for a reason. And the Bible tells you that, and look, I realize that sometimes some of these things are needed, but a lot of times they're not. And the psychiatrist has done a lot of harm yeah. to people yeah. because you can take, and if you're, what it is, they're looking for peace. Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible talks about how that when God brings correction in someone's life, no chastening for the moment seemeth joyous, but afterwards it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So Christian, here's one thing that maybe the bad feeling is coming from. Maybe it's coming from the fact that you're not right with God. And so because of that, God's got to whoop up on you. So instead of running to a drug or a sedative of some kind to help you feel better, get right with God. And then it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You see that? See that? Now, I realize that some instances it's that some of that stuff is needed, but I don't think it's needed nearly the amount that people are on it. Because we have a society that is so wrecked by sin. And Christians, let's be honest, most Christians love their sin too. They don't want to get right with God. And so they'd rather take something to overcome the anxiety or the depression or something. And a lot of times those might just be indicators that God has put in us that kind of help us push, push in the right direction. Now, like I said, I'm not a doctor, but I know this. I know that that book right there, that book right there holds a key to a lot of things. And I wonder how many Christians who are taking all this medication 
are not taking the medication of the Word of God. And I don't mean this stupid verse a day thing. That's stupid. Ever seen these little things in the Bible apps where they give you the devotion for the day? You know, and you look on there, some, somebody in there, there, you know, it's a little five-minute clip, and they're, if that, you know, and they're talking to you, and they're telling you something, you know, and that's supposed to be your spiritual shot in the arm, help you do, that's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> like, get in and read the pure word of God, yeah. just read it, that's what you need, get the book in you, and I tell you, the more messed up your mind is, the more Bible you need. Because I guarantee you, sin messes up the mind. And just walking through life, even if you're not trying to actively go after sin, I guarantee your mind still gets messed up. And, uh, and so you need to get in the Word of God. So uh, maybe, you know, maybe that'll be a help and keep you off of the, you know, psychiatrist making money off you. And, you just put that money in the plate. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> All right, go to First Kings. I knew there was a catch. No, First Kings chapter two. First Kings chapter two. No, I hope that helps you. First Kings two. Now David is coming uh, here to the end of his life, and uh, I think yeah, last time we were together, I think I did chapter one. Yeah. So here we are in chapter two. So this is the uh, once again, this is a continuation of the rise to power. Of Solomon it says verse 1 now the days of David uh, drew nigh that he should die and he charged Solomon his son saying and then he makes this statement I go the way of all the earth can I tell you this a hundred percent of the people born will die if the Lord tarries <laughs> you will die if the Lord tarries. you have an appointment with death I'm reading this book by John Patton I told you about it so don't worry you want to get some illustrations about John Patton over the next few weeks and uh, so anyway, I'm reading this book about, uh, about him, and he was getting ready to go over to the New Hebrides there, and there are cannibals over there. And uh, this fellow looked at him, and he said, uh, why are you going to go over there and, and uh, be there with the cannibals? You're going to get eaten by cannibals. And he says, look, he says, we only die once. I would rather let the Lord choose the time and the place. Uh, when the coronavirus hit, everybody freaked out. Everybody freaked out. Why? They didn't want to die. But can I tell you something, Christian? If the Lord wants you dead, it doesn't have to be a virus. It can kill you anyway. So just live your life for the Lord Jesus Christ because you can't die until he's ready for you to die. You have an appointment. You won't miss it. <laughs> Don't worry about that. You won't miss your appointment. <laughs> you know, you're going you're gonna to go the way of all the earth. Uh, you get, uh, you, you're born. You start going, getting strong, getting the flower of your life, and then all of a sudden you start to wilt and, and you die. That's uh, generally speaking the way it goes. I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. Oh, there's that toxic masculinity again. <laughs> we could use a little, more, a little more manhood in this country. We really could use it. And can I tell you this, uh, gentlemen? There's nothing wrong with being a man. I think you know this. I think I'm in good company here. And uh, the Bible makes men. The Bible makes men. Uh, a lot of the dangers of our fundamentalist brethren is that they want to turn out everyone to be like the preacher is. So, for example, you go into some of these churches and you'll see that everybody has the exact same haircut as the preacher has. No lie. They have the exact same haircut. They all dress the same way. When they preach many times, they try to preach the same exact way. And there's nothing wrong with trying to emulate somebody that you look up to. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the Bible says about someone like that whose faith follow. Doesn't talk about their eating habits and their dressing style. Oh, doesn't talk about following. Let's say whose faith follow. Now I'll tell you what. If you want to be, the world talks about being uh, being uh, unique. Well, the Bible will make you unique. It will. Uh, spend time in it, and that book will make you unique. All right. Now he says, and keep uh, verse three, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes and His commandments, and His judgments and His testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. All right, so he was supposed to uh, keep himself in the law of Moses. Now take your Bible and go over to Deuteronomy 17. This is the exact... You see, uh, David knew Scripture. He knew it very well. Even when David was backslidden, I've shown you this before, even when he was backslidden, he was quoting Scripture. Remember that? <clears throat> so when he sinned, 
And Nathan the prophet came to him and said, this guy stole the sheep. He goes, I'm going to kill that guy, and he's going to restore four sheep for a sheep. And some people are wondering, why did he say that? Because that was the law. You steal a sheep, you've got to restore four sheep. Now, in Deuteronomy 17, so he's telling them to stay in the law of Moses. That's what they have at the time, so that's what he's telling them to stay in. And in Deuteronomy 17, verse 14, it says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me like as all the nations that are about me. Boy, the Lord had their number, didn't he? <laughs> thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from, now that, now when they got Saul, that's not what they did. That was the people's choice. Mm -hmm. Saul was the people's choice. David was God's choice. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not, now watch it, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. So they're supposed to stay away from Egypt. They're not to multiply horses. Well, you're going to find out that, that, uh, that Solomon <laughs> marries a girl from Egypt, and he makes an alliance uh, with them, and he multiplies horses to them. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. <laughs> well, I think he broke that one. <laughs> this guy had 700 wives and 300 concubines, or as the Sunday school kid said, uh, 700 wives and 300 porcupines. <laughs> Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. Why? That his heart turned not away. Didn't Solomon's heart turn away? Yeah. I'll show you that in a few minutes if we get to it. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Didn't he do that? Yeah. Sure did. And it shall be when he sitteth, now watch this. It shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. So notice God authorized copies of the scripture being written. I just saw that. Ain't that something? <laughs> so these, these folks that talk about, you know, going back to the originals and all we have are copies. The Lord himself authorized copies. Now, what was he supposed to do? So he was to write out, he was to write out by hand, he was to write out a book of the law. So he was to write out Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He was to write that thing out. And what was he supposed to do with it? And it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life. Why? That he may learn uh, to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of these, this law and these statutes, to do them. That's why America doesn't fear God, because they're not Bible readers. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. That's why so many people are full of pride these days, not in the book. You stay in the book, it'll help you with pride. And that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Now, notice he was to read every day. Every day he was to read from the book of the law. Now, this is what the king was supposed to do, and that's what David uh, tells his son. He tells him here, he says uh, uh, that he's to, he, uh, he's to uh, keep this, the, the commandments and the judgment and the testimonies as it's written in the law of Moses, and the only way he's going to know it is if he reads it. And the reason why a lot of Christians don't know their Bibles is because they don't read it. Now, according to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, we're kings. Now, you don't see that yet, but we're going to reign if we suffer with him. We'll reign with him one day in the millennium as kings. Well, as a king, shouldn't you be in that book every single day? See that spiritual application for you? All right, so he goes ahead and he gives them some instructions here. David does in 1 Kings chapter 2. And he tells them about a, a few fellows. In verse 5, he talks, gives them some instructions about Joab. Basically says, don't let Joab go to the grave peacefully. In verse 7, he talks about Barzillai the Gileadite. Barzillai was the old man who helped David when David was running for his life from Absalom. And uh, Barzillai was an older gentleman, he's in his 80s, and he, he told, uh, uh, David said, come with me back to Jerusalem, and he said, no, no, I'm too old, you take my, my servant Chimham and you take him. So he said, do, do right by Barzillai, do right. And then he says, Shimei, you know, watch that boy, <laughs> and I know that you'll, you'll do right, you'll do right, you got to be careful about that fella. So David dies, that's going the way of all the earth in verse 10. And it tells you how long his reign was, verse 11. And the days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron. That was his first capital. 
And three and thirty years reigned he in Jerusalem. That was his second capital, and that remained the capital of uh, Judah until they eventually went into captivity. And Solomon takes the throne. Now, when Solomon takes the throne, I want you to notice that immediately there's a fellow by the name of Adonijah who decides to go ahead and uh, cause a little bit of trouble. Now, this Adonijah is the same Adonijah that tried to take the throne. And here's what happens. In verse 13, And Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and she said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I mean, she's got her, her, her spidey senses go off about this guy, you know. He said, but she doesn't have an, uh, uh, that much spidey sense, as we'll see here in a second. He said, moreover, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And she said, say on. And he said, thou knowest that the kingdom was mine. <laughs> now here's a, you know, I can imagine him coming in all humble. Now, now, now Bathsheba, I, I mean, we all know that, that I, I was supposed to have the kingdom. But, but hey, but hey, I, I wasn't the guy, even though, I, it, was, even though it was, you know, was mine. But I wasn't the guy. So it, was, it went to Solomon, you know, and, and I understand that. No hard feelings, and, and I completely, I'm completely behind him. I'm completely behind him, so I have a favor to ask of you. I would like for you to go to, to Solomon, and I'd like you to ask him one thing for me, because you're his mom, and he won't tell you no. I'd like you to ask him if he just, I'd like to marry Abishag, the Shunammite. I mean, I just, it's, just, it's just love. I just love first sight. I just absolutely love this girl. I want, can, you, can you go and talk to Talk to him. Now, if you don't remember who Abishag the Shunammite was, that was the young lady that was connected to David there at the end of his life. Remember, we talked about that last time we were together. <laughs> now, uh, you know what he's trying to do, right? You know what he's trying to do? Basically, he does not want to just let Solomon be the king. He's trying to work at it at another angle. That's what he's trying to do. So he figures he gets in connection with somebody who was there with David at the end, and he's trying to work another angle. So Solomon goes in, uh, I mean, Bathsheba goes into Solomon, and, and when, uh, when, when Bathsheba comes in, Solomon stands up, and he says, hey, hey, bring a chair for mom. And so they bring a chair, and he says, mom, sit down. And, and she says, uh, son, I, I want to ask you a question. Uh, I'm going to ask you something now, and I don't want you to tell me no. And he says to her, he says, mom, he says, I won't tell you no. You go ahead and ask me your question. She says, well, she says, son, she says, uh, you know, your brother, your brother, he, uh, he, would, he would like to marry, he would like to marry Abishag the Shunammite. All of a sudden, Solomon said, oh, oh, he wants to marry Abishag. Why don't you just ask for him the kingdom too, mom? Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, I thought about that, and I thought about, well, Solomon said he wouldn't tell her no. Yeah. But he ends up saying this, watch. He doesn't tell mom no because it's not mom that's asking. Right. Notice in verse 20, at the end of the verse, he says, Ask on my mother, for I will not say thee nay. Verse 23, Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God did so to me to more also, if Adonijah have not spoken this word against his own life. So even though Bathsheba's the mouthpiece, it's Adonijah that's doing the talking. He's just a snake in the grass is what he is. And so he says, uh, he says, basically, Mom, he's trying to take the kingdom. He snaps his fingers like that, and up steps Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, who's the new captain of the host, and he says, I got a little uh, something I need you to take care of. And uh, so he says, uh, he dispatches him down there, and, and of course, as this goes on, uh, uh, Adonijah hears about it, and he runs down to the altar, and he grabs a hold of the horns of the altar. Uh, notice, uh, where does it say that? Uh, he says, I am. Oh, no, 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 that was, uh, that was Abiathar that grabs a hold of the horn, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I got him mixed up, got him mixed up. Notice, let's just read it, verse 24. Now, therefore, as the Lord liveth, which hath with has established me and set me on the throne of David my father, and who hath made me an house, as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death uh, this day. And King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and he fell upon him that he died. So uh, Ad, uh, that's right, Ad, uh, Adonijah had ran to the horns of the altar before, and that's when uh, Solomon told him if there's any evil found him, then, you know, you'll die. And so obviously there's evil found him, he dies. Now verse 26, uh, Abiathar the priest. Now Abiathar the priest, if you don't remember uh, your history just a little bit, I'll try to make the connection for you. Do you remember when there was a fella, um, not Ehud, uh, killed all the priests at Nob, uh, Doeg the Edomite. Doeg the Edomite 
uh, had, uh, all, had lied about David uh, when David was running from Saul. And, uh, and Saul came in and had all the priests at Nob killed, and this fellow Doeg the Edomite is the one that killed them all. Well, there was one fellow that slipped out of the back, grabbed the ephod, and took off and ran to David. That's this guy, Abiathar. You making the connections now? All right, now look at verse 26. And unto Abiathar the priest uh, said the king. Now remember, Abiathar, in his older age, he was connected with Adonijah. He defected. And so he says, uh, Get thee to Anathoth unto thine own fields, for thou art worthy of death. But I will not at this time put thee to death, because thou bearest the ark of the Lord God before David my father, and because thou wast, hast been afflicted, and all wherein my father was afflicted. You know what I appreciate about this? Abiathar in his old age went the wrong direction. But you know what Solomon does? Solomon... He doesn't discount everything that the old boy had done in his life. He knew that he had, in his younger years, he had been there afflicted with David, his father, and he had gone through some things. Uh, he, but he got older, he made some mistakes. He didn't keep them. He didn't overlook the mistakes. He acknowledged them, kicked him out of the office as being priest, but at the same time said, because you did go through a lot of things, I'm not going to discount all that. You know what we do in our society? <laughs> The second somebody makes a mistake, you discount everything that person has ever done and you kill them. Yeah. That's the way we are. Yeah. Well, Solomon wouldn't like that. But Solomon kept his eye on him, so you better toe the line. Uh, but he made sure to not discount everything that he did. What is interesting is that Abiathar is in Eli's line. Look in verse 27. And you know that Eli was a bad priest and the Lord told him uh, that he wasn't going to have a successful line in the priesthood. Well... Tidings reached Joab's ear. When tidings reached Joab's ear, Joab, this time, Joab runs and grabs a hold of the horns of the altar. And uh, Benaiah is dispatched to, uh, to discard or to execute uh, Joab. So this is, you got to understand, these are two uh, war dogs. These are two mighty men. These are two soldiers. Uh, Benaiah now is the general and he is sent to go and kill his former boss. Uh, he used to work for Joab, but Joab defected, and Joab in David's lifetime had killed some men in cold-blooded murder. Uh, how many of you remember a fella, I'm losing my names, not Abner. How many remember Abner? Remember, remember I told you the story of Abner? And how Abner had been Saul's general, had killed Joab's brother, in war, but then Abner was in a city of a refuge at the time, Hebron, and Joab called him back and killed him in a city of refuge. Even if it was an accident, he still wasn't, he wasn't able to be the revenger of blood right now. It was in wartime, so he had to let that thing go. And so Joab here, Joab killed a guy in cold blood and murder. Joab killed Absalom when David said, please don't do it, and he did. Uh, Joab, Joab got to the point where he had a total disregard for David. And once he started killing, I guess after that it just came easy to him. And so David told him, hey, look, you don't let that old man come down to the grave in peace. Because there's a difference in shedding blood in war and shedding blood in murder. There's a difference. And so he says, you need to, you need to kill that guy. And so Benaiah goes down there and he says, uh, he walks up there and he says, uh, Hey, Joab, come on out. I need to talk to you for a minute. <laughs> Joab says, I ain't no idiot. <laughs> That's the original Hebrew. He says, I ain't no idiot. <laughs> you want me, you come get me. <laughs> so Benaiah runs back to Solomon. He says, I got a problem. <laughs> he says, he's in the temple. He grabbed hold of the horns of the altar. How am, I, how, how am I supposed to do this? And he says, kill him where he is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I think a lot of people will hide under the auspices of religion as uh, some type of protection but the Lord will kill you right where you stand it doesn't matter what you're hiding under and so old Joab and I goes in there and he killed old Joab and when if you ever listen to Dr. Ruckman's ad-lib commentary when he talks about this he says uh, he says when Benai went in there he says there was old Joab and he had his armor laid aside and he was standing there at perfect attention of course, uh, Doc Ruckman kind of likes uh, Joab, so he makes him a Prussian soldier, you know. <laughs> so
So there he is standing there, and he says, Joab was probably only, the only man in Benaiah's history and career that ever looked him in the eye when he killed him. <laughs> and he said he was just a soldier, you know, standing there. And that was just him putting uh, Joab up there on a pedestal. But, you know, Joab, he, uh, he was a soldier, but he had killed innocent blood. And so in order for innocent blood to be cleared, you have to kill and shed the blood of the man who took innocent blood. Verse 31 tells you that, that how, that's how they needed to take away the innocent blood. Well, he went ahead and he killed him uh, there, and they buried uh, Joab in his house. He had a house in the wilderness, verse 34. Of course he had a house in the wilderness. <laughs> Uh, you, I wouldn't imagine Joab living anywhere else. <laughs> I mean, you know, Joab, uh, he would go out, he'd go out to war. You know, he'd be there in the city. He'd lead the parades. But when he went home, he wanted to go be where nobody was. <laughs> and so that's where this old boy lived. Well, now, verse 35, Benaiah takes Joab's uh, spot. Zadok is put in the Biathar spot. Now the kingdom is established. Verse 36, it says, The king sent call for Shimei and said unto him, Build thee a house in Jerusalem and dwell there and go not forth thence any whither. For it shall be that on the day that thou goest out and passest over the brook Kidron, thou shalt know for certain that thou shalt surely die. Thy blood shall be upon thine own head. Now, basically what he told him is, You build a house here where I keep an eye on you. And if you leave, you want to die. It, but it's not, it, you won't die as long as you stay here. This is what you call house arrest. <laughs> Except he's in the city. He has a radius uh, that he had to be. Well, after a couple of years, I think it's two years go by, he has, or three years, end of three years, verse 39, two of his servants run away. And they run to a place called Gath. And so uh, Shimei goes after him. And he goes after him and brings him back. Well, as soon as he gets back, Solomon says, well, you just broke their house arrest rules, and so you're going to die. It's not like, you know, uh, it seems like uh, today, it seems like uh, you, you just get, you know, I just get another chance, and another chance, and another chance. Solomon says, uh, hey, you agreed to this. This is what I told you. Actually, there was no agreement to it. This is what I told you, and you broke it, and he killed them, had him killed. Uh, you know what a lot of people, uh, time went by, three years went by. Uh, you know, a lot of people are like that. They think, well, time, time went by, you know. They kind of look at God's long-suffering that way the same way. Time went by, no, no, no. Uh, God might be long-suffering, but he will deal with things. He will deal with things. All right, so uh, here we go. We finish off, and the kingdom is established. Uh, here to, to Solomon. Takes care of these final things. Notice in verse 46, at the end of the verse, it says, and the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. Now, in the next chapter, and we'll finish up with this chapter, we find that Solomon <laughs> made an affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter. Now, I, don't have, I, I was going to run a whole thing on this tonight, but I, I won't do it. I'll do this at another time. We'll come back to it. But an affinity, the dictionary definition of affinity, is the relation contracted by marriage between a husband and his wife's kindred. So you remember how, like, you read about in history how you get two countries would join together and they do it through marriage? That's what that is. He's told not to have anything to do with Egypt. Now, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of stuff on this uh, at another time, but there's a reason why God told them you're not to intermarry with anybody around you. And the reason is because their cultures and their gods that they serve, they will turn your heart away to go serve those gods. And I'll show you all this, and you, we'll walk through uh, why. I'll show you why God let Israel come in there and kill all those people and wipe them out. And I will also show you how God gave those people about 400 years before he let them do that because their iniquity was not yet full. And then I'll show you how I don't know if God has a threshold, and I don't know where that threshold is where he says I'm done with a country. I don't know where that threshold is, but I know where his judgment will begin. I'll show you where it will begin. Uh, Paul tells you where it will begin. All right, now I want to show you this. Uh, there's something great that happens between, we'll circle back to that next time because that is going to be an entire service. Notice what happens in verse 4. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there for... That was a, the great high place. And he, got, he sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings. 
Now, they didn't have, the, the temple wasn't built at this time, so they would go up to the high place and they make these sacrifices. He does a thousand of these things. Well, he goes ahead and he has, uh, uh, goes to sleep that night, and the Lord uh, meets him in, in Gibeon, and the Lord tells him, uh, hey, ask, ask whatever you want. Blank check. Ask what you want, and I'll give it to you. Now, the modern American would say, well, <laughs> now that you're asking, you know, kind of like uh, Jeannie says, you have three wishes. You ask your first two wishes. And the third wish is, can I have three more wishes? You know, or something like that, you know. It's like, uh, like the one guy said, he, he had the genie there. <laughs> Don't go down that road. All right, I won't go down that road. <laughs> no, she might be listening. Oh, well, here we go. This is from my mother-in-law. <laughs> so you go ahead and uh, this genie says, uh, uh, says, I'll give three wishes, right? <laughs> I love my mother-in-law, so I'm, just, I'm telling us anyway. So he goes, <laughs> he goes ahead and he says, Jeannie says, look, you got three wishes. He says, uh, but whatever, whatever, you, whatever you wish, your mother-in-law gets twice as much. He says, okay. He says, I wish for a million dollars. He says, that's fine, but your mother-in-law gets two million dollars. Okay, all right, that's fine. He says, and I wish for a ranch-style house. And he goes, okay, but your mother-in-law gets two. He goes, all right, all right, all right. And he says, what's your last, what's your last uh, wish? And so he thought really hard, and all of a sudden a grin came across his face, and he says, I wish you beat me half to death. <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible. That's terrible. All right. <laughs> My mother-in-law's listening. I love you, Mom. <laughs> all right. Now, <laughs> now notice. So what he does, he tells him, he doesn't ask him for riches, doesn't ask for fame, doesn't ask for life as enemies. He, said, uh, he says, Lord, he says, you know, he said, I don't know how to, I don't know how to be a king. I don't know how to lead these people. So I'm asking you for one thing. I'm asking you for wisdom so I know how to lead these people. And the Lord says, you know what? Because you asked that of me, I'm going to give you the other things on top of it. Now, I want to tell you something, Christian. I think a lot of us say, well, if the Lord asked me that, I'd definitely ask for wisdom <laughs> because you know in your heart what you really want. <laughs> but can I tell you, the Bible tells you in Proverbs that wisdom is the principal thing. And uh, one thing you're to get is you're to get wisdom. That is the principal thing to ask for. So even without having the scripture to tell him to ask for it, he actually asked for the greatest thing he could ask for, and that is wisdom. And uh, this ends up getting proven on just uh, that God came through on his request. So there's, there's these two harlots uh, that come before uh, uh, Solomon. I had somebody ask me, they didn't know what that was, and that's uh, basically a, a streetwalker, a hooker. And so these two harlots, they come uh, to Solomon one day, and they, have, uh, they each had a kid. They had a kid. And uh, one of them had, uh, uh, they, at, at night, they were sleeping with their kids next to them, and one of them rolled on top of her kid and smothered it, woke up in the middle of the night, saw what she had done, swapped babies uh, without the other one knowing, and then woke up the next morning, and the one woman woke up, and she goes, oh, you know, my kid's dead, you know. And also she looked at it, and she said, wait, this is not my kid. Now, ladies, you know, you would know which one's your kid. But the other woman says, no, 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 that's your kid. That is your kid right there. As you laid on top of your baby in the middle of the night. You smothered your baby. Now, that's just, that's just terrible. I mean, it's horrible that the, you know, the, the baby died. But now this woman... What kind of a mind does that? Oh, that's, that's, your, that's your, your baby. So they come here, they bring this thing to Solomon. When they bring it to Solomon, uh, they say exactly that. And then the one woman says, no, the dead baby is her baby, and the living baby is my baby. And the other woman says the exact same thing. No, the dead baby is her baby, and the living baby is my baby. Solomon says, wow. Oh, this is a conundrum. That's the other original Hebrew. <laughs> he says, we got a problem here. So he says, uh, I got an idea. Bring me a sword. And so uh, they brought him a sword, you know, and I could imagine them, everybody going, what do you bring him a sword for, you know? And uh, he says, all right, since we have a dilemma here and we can't figure out who actually gets the living baby, Let's just split it in half. And then each of you can have the baby. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, one of the women goes, uh, yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, if I can't have the living kid and you can't have the living kid, we might as well just split the baby. 
But then this other woman over here goes, whoa, time out. Don't do that. Just, she can have it. She can have the baby. Don't, don't kill the baby. And you know when that woman said it, you know, put yourself in her shoes. I mean, you're the desperation. Because when the king says something, that's it. It's going to happen. So I imagine the soldier gets over and he takes that and a guy, another soldier reaches over, grabs that baby. One soldier holds the legs. The other soldier holds the baby by the arms. One soldier takes that sword and reaches that sword. About. I mean, the king said to do it. You just do it. I can imagine that woman. She's over here. She's begging. No, 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 please, 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 please. I beg you. No, please, 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 please. Don't do it. Don't do it. Let her have it. Let her have it. She can have it. She can have it. No, no, no. This is fantastic. This is a great idea. I don't have it. You don't have it. That's a great idea, king. And the king goes, stop. Give it to her. And all of a sudden, everybody goes, whoa. And they saw the wisdom that God had given Solomon. You know what, folks? We live in a day and age where there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. And you have no idea what to do. Shouldn't you be seeking wisdom? You know what it says about Jesus Christ? He's made unto us wisdom. When you get ready to do something, how about like Nehemiah, praying right away, Lord, I need wisdom. There are books in your Bible that are dedicated to wisdom. One of them has 31 chapters in it which shows you, you should read one every single day. So today's the 22nd. So can you guess what proverb you should have read today? 22. You say, well, what happens when we get to a month that only has 30 days? You read 30 and 31. Ah, see that? And then you get through it 12 times in a year. Folks, we need, what's that? Well, amen, brother. Then we got to read 28, 29, 30, and 31. Amen. <laughs> amen. So, brothers and sisters, I'd like to ask you, wisdom is the principal thing. God has given you a book filled with wisdom. You got the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. Are you taking advantage of what the Lord has put? Because if we need wisdom, we need it today. Okay, Lord, I thank you for today. I hope the uh, Bible study was helpful. I pray that you help us to uh, seek after wisdom. You did say is the principal thing. Uh, help us as we read our Bibles, and I pray that it become more alive to us. Help us to notice every word in this book, because every word is pure. Please continue to open up our eyes to these things. We love you, and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stand up.